What is up, guys? Welcome back to Title Gardens. Over the years, I have attended a number of trade shows, such as Macna, Aqua, which is in the UK. I've been to Reefstock, Reefapalooza, and most recently, Aquashella in Dallas. I often get asked at these shows, where's your booth? Are you exhibiting? And at that point, I have to let them down and let them know that, guys, I haven't set up a booth since like 2015. It is so much work, but a lot has changed since the last time that I set up a booth at one of these shows. And while setting up a booth may not be in my immediate future, I wanted to make this video with some insider tips and tricks if you ever wanted to be a seller at a trade show. I've got 10 tips for you, so let's get right into it. First, let's talk about the tanks themselves. Back in the day when I did these shows, it was like the Wild West in the sort of tanks people would bring to sell coral. I once saw someone bring in what looked like a 50-gallon tank to sell corals, and they were like selling a dozen corals only. And we're not talking a 50-gallon low-profile frag tank. I mean a 50-gallon breeder that was every bit of 20 inches deep. Nowadays, there are some more consistent sizes, and they're all roughly 10 inches or so in depth. Actually, 10 inches is probably the deepest one. I've seen some of these shows that are like really shallow, something in the neighborhood of 4 inches even, but let's say 4 to 10 inches. I'd also break these tanks into two categories. There's tanks that you drive to the venue, and then there's tanks that fly with you. Obviously, the ones that drive can bring larger tanks with more corals and possibly their own source of water rather than sourcing it locally at the destination venue. If you're able to drive a van to a venue, you're really only limited to your boot size and what you can stuff into your vehicle. Frost Corals, for example, from Ohio, he goes everywhere and brings a gigantic setup to all these various shows. If you've seen him, you know it's like a dozen tanks or something like that. And all of that is traveling in one vehicle, as far as I know. As for the ones that fly, well, let's talk about that. It is crazy for me to imagine because back in the day, nobody did this. But a lot of vendors at these shows, they fly a system of tanks and equipment as checked luggage. And then they carry on all their corals onto the plane. They have it down to a science to maximize storage in a checked pelican case and to keep the entire thing under 50 pounds, which is the weight limit on checked luggage before racking up additional fees. They also have to fit inside the 62 linear inch rule, and that's for carry-ons. So the most popular size I've seen is 24 inches by 18 inches by 20 inches. Also, some of those that fly are able to have multiple aquariums in that travel case because they size them just tight enough that they can nest one inside the other. When side by side on the table, you would never notice that one was ever so slightly smaller than the other. I've seen some vendors that do a hybrid of the drive and fly, where they send their booth by ground, and they fly the rest of their employees and air freight their corals on the same plane. This is obviously an option for some of the bigger vendors in the industry, so that might not apply to a startup coral seller, but it is something that is done by some of the other companies out there. By the way, this reminds me, back in the day, when people didn't know what the hell they were doing, got the bright idea of going to a show and setting up a tank, but they brought no corals. Instead, they would just place an order with a wholesaler and have the wholesaler send it to the venue. They would take freshly imported corals and plop them right into their tanks for sale that weekend. Needless to say, that did not go well. Freshly imported corals are often in super rough shape, and a trade show system is not a healthy environment to take in a large wholesale order. It was a mess, and I remember some of these corals are just literally dying in front of you as the show went on. Yeah, thankfully, that was a trend that never caught on. It was really dumb, especially when delivery delays are a thing. Speaking of delays, this is tip number two. My flight, along with just about everybody else's in the Dallas area Friday afternoon, was severely delayed. 
Mine was delayed by about six hours. They had a storm. They sent me off to Austin. We landed and they basically said, we don't know when you're going to get to Dallas. And I'm thinking, great, I might be spending the night in Austin. But anyway, that's a story for another time. But luckily for me, I was not traveling with sensitive animals. My friend John Bowie from Clam Mania, however, was in that same situation. And the whole time he was worried about his clams that were in his checked baggage. That day, it was about 90 degrees in Dallas, and John was expecting a relatively short flight from Southern California, not a six-hour delay. So, the moral of this story is to prepare for travel delays when it comes to livestock. Have really high-performing coolers if you can. Use heat and cold packs with a lengthy duration, way more than you might think. In this case, John would have had a little bit more peace of mind if his clams had a cold pack. In cold weather, the ideal heat pack is actually a 72-hour heat pack from Uniheat. Sounds like overkill for what should be, you know, a four-hour flight. But the reason why you want the 72-hour version is that not only does it last super long, but it has the lowest burning temperature of all of their different lineups. So like the 24s actually burn crazy hot, whereas the 72 burns at like 105 to 110 degrees, which is just perfect. It's much less risky to overheat the water. One of the vendors, this is Justin from North American Coral Labs, showed me this cooler that he uses as a carry-on. It has this little access pouch, and if he's ever worried about that heat pack, he can double check it to see if it's still working or not. Tip number three. Now that we've transported everything safely, let's talk about the booth itself. Starting with the table. Usually, a table will be provided by the venue, but there is an argument that if you are driving, you might want to make plans to bring your own. I've had some places that had these tables and they were expecting maybe a birthday cake on top of it in terms of weight, not 30 gallons of salt water, not 60 to 90 gallons of salt water in some cases. I've seen this go both ways where either the tables are pretty good or they're downright scary. Also, if you have a display that is intended to be looked at from the side, now you're talking about a situation where a taller table might make sense for you. So again, if you're driving, consider that as an option. Something that was unheard of when I was setting up was a blackout tent over the entire booth. I would guess that about a third of the booths now that sell corals use a tent to control the light hitting their tank. And I totally get it. You don't always know what the venue will have as far as lighting goes. Some might be super cavernous, which is nice for selling coral, but some might be lit up crazy, which would drown out all your stuff. I remember one time I set up a booth that was literally a car showroom that had floor-to-ceiling glass walls on three of the four walls. Yeah, a tent in that situation would have made a big difference. Having said that, this might just be a personal preference thing, but while the light is better controlled, it also hides your booth to some degree. So when walking the floor, I tend to gravitate to the booths that seem more open and airy. But that's just me. I am curious, what do you guys think? Those of you who have been to these shows, do you like the booth thing or do you like the wide open displays? Next tip, tip number four. You know what else I gravitated towards? Clear water. There might be a lot of other vendors. And one way to stand out from the others is to have crystal clear water. There were a couple of aquariums at this particular show and they were fresh water, but they were so highly polished that it looked like there wasn't even water in them at all. Anyhow, after transporting these corals across the country to a show, they're likely to be extra slimy and upset with you. The water, possibly supplied to you by the venue and recently mixed, might still be a little turbid. For whatever reason, the water almost always starts off cloudy when setting up. That has to get cleared up before the doors open, and the booths that do this job better will stand out. Luckily, the bigger shows let people set up the day before, which is nice because it gives the tanks some time to clear up. There are a couple of recurring themes when it comes to getting this job done. First, I saw a number of booths using regular freshwater power filters, and I can see why they would be so popular. 
they're inexpensive, and you can set them up right on the rim of the aquarium, and you have both water circulation and polishing depending on what kind of pads that you decide to put in them. You can use just the regular filter stuff or the filter stuff that's impregnated with carbon. Speaking of carbon, I've seen plenty of vendors using these lifeguard media reactors and running activated carbon. Activated carbon is great in this application because it soaks up and neutralizes organics from the corals that could be harmful to other corals. When they're stressed out, a lot of that mucus can be used for as biological warfare. It also polishes the water and removes any of those yellow tannins. A few other booths went with a different model of media reactor, and I'm sorry I don't know the name of this off the top, but it has like a removable cartridge that just sits in there. And that particular vendor preferred it to the lifeguard unit because you didn't have to undo four screws and deal with loose media that can be a messy process if you ever had to rebed the carbon. Those filters and reactors are great at polishing up the water itself. That leaves one more thing to clean in your display, and that is the surface. Surface scum can build up over the course of the show, and several exhibitors have gone with these all-in-one type designs for their exhibition tanks. There's the main section where they're displaying their corals for sale, but they have this back section, which we will talk about extensively later. But for the purposes of clearing that scum layer, the water gets to the back section through an overflow surface skimmer weir, and usually through some type of filter material or even another bag of carbon. For the tanks that do not use this design, I've also seen some devices that act functionally similar. This is basically a little overflow that's attached to a pump, and that does a good job of breaking up that surface scum layer. Lastly, for some of the larger displays, I've seen them either use a small sump underneath or a canister filter. My only worry with some of these is that in a traveling system, lots of connections through the tank can leak. It's one thing in a home system that stays more or less static, but in a setup that gets jostled around and travel, some wiggles get loose and water finds the path of least resistance. So something to consider. Next tip, tip number five. One thing you might have not considered is inverts. Unless you are in the business of selling inverts like clam mania, I would not recommend bringing them at all if possible. Stress and temperature fluctuations have a funny way of making them spawn. And more than a few times, I have seen someone bring in something random, like a sea urchin, and that thing just spawns immediately the next day. Maybe they were just trying to sell a one-off invert or something, but that thing can turn your entire display into milk. It's not an insurmountable problem, but it is super stressful to try to do a few like 100% water changes before the doors open because some snail or urchin decides to broadcast spawn. And just to illustrate my point further, clam mania, the clams in one of his tanks totally spawned and he had to battle that all of Saturday, big water changes and that protein skimmer had to go into extra overdrive. Tip number six. The next thing that I would want to talk about isn't so much of a tip. It's a consideration in how you design your tank and your booth. How would you like your tank to be viewed? From the side or from the top? It's a balancing act because you don't want your tanks too deep for travel reasons. You don't want them too shallow because then there's really no visibility from the sides. And side viewing is important because in order to provide decent flow in a shallow aquarium, there's going to be a good amount of surface agitation. And viewing through surface agitation, it's a deal killer. What I have seen some vendors do is periodically shut off pumps to let people look or photograph the corals with no surface disturbance, and then fire up the pumps once those customers walk away. I've also seen some tanks that have power heads basically sending water low in the tank under the frag trays to minimize the amount of surface that gets disturbed. If you can kind of imagine like an undertow flow pattern, there really isn't a right or wrong answer to this, but it is something to keep in mind and to make a deliberate choice on. Next tip. This suggestion is kind of an unfortunate one to have to bring up. 
but I've seen some trade show displays that have a locking cover. Usually the vendor that has to go to these lengths has had a negative experience either with theft or outright sabotage. Stuff happens at these shows, guys. You can't protect yourself from everything, but I guess there's levels to this, right? I've seen trade shows where after the setup, there's a locking cover that goes over the tank, and then the entire tent booth zips up and is locked. Normally, I would think that is overkill, but I actually have personal experience with this one. Way back when I did these shows, this probably was, I don't know, 2012, 2010, who knows. One place let us set up the night before, and after, the venue was locked. But some members of the hosting club, the host club, okay, went back in, got drunk, and they were playing Mario Kart with the hotel Bellman carts, and they were vandalizing the booths, one of which was mine. Mine was really minor, but another setup was not so lucky. Their whole table got knocked over. Tank, corals, fish, everything. And we're talking about the group hosting the event. Can you imagine the amount of damage that can be done by an actual hostile actor? So yes, unfortunately, you have to have some mind towards security. Stuff happens. Tip number eight. The bigger shows are multi-day affairs, usually Saturday and Sunday, but some extend even longer than that. So... It is not entirely uncommon for a buyer on the first day to request you hold that coral for them, and they'll pick it up towards the end of the day Sunday when you're ready to break down. That sounds completely reasonable, right? As a vendor, have an organizational system so you know who bought what, paid for what, and ideally have a way of separating their stuff away so that it doesn't get accidentally sold to somebody else. Best practice that I've seen is to use magnetic frag racks. In particular, I like the ones that are sized to go into the all-in-one partition behind everything, so there's no confusion that these corals are no longer for sale. Speaking of that back partition, I'll call this tip number nine. There are all kinds of good uses for it beyond what we just discussed. That back panel is also great for notes, as you can see here. You can either put customer information back there, or in this case, pricing for the more expensive corals. Okay, let's talk about that for just a sec. You might be wondering, why not just put the price out front with the corals? And really, there's no problem with that at all. Lots of people do it. I guess, for me, there's only two downsides. And the first one is that it takes a valuable space on the rack. But the other issue is that there's this trend towards using fluorescent plastic numbers. It's super eye-catching. But that might not be the best thing in the world. This is just me brainstorming here. A lot of people do it, so I could be wrong. But I want the corals to be the eye-catching element in the display and not glowing plastic because the glowing plastic has the added effect of producing this really unflattering flashlight effect right next to the coral. You can see here one of the pointer tubes sending yellow light onto the coral that it's pointing at. And that's great if you're using just a pointer, but if it's your entire pricing scheme, less great in my view. Last thing that I'll point out, that can be done with this back area. And this is really genius, I think. The Top Shelf Aquatics booth installed an easy fill spout. Hopefully during these shows, you're gonna be doing a lot of packing and selling, but it kind of sucks to have to scoop a bag of water from the display portion of the tank. It makes a splashy mess, it drips everywhere, it obstructs the view of other people at the booth that are shopping, etc., etc. This little fill spout can be done quickly, discreetly, nice and clean, I love it. Okay, 10th and final tip, you guys. Not all shows are going to perform well for sales. Pretty much every show that I've ever been to has a distinct vibe. This show, Aquashella, leans very hard into spectacle and is a ton of fun. But that audience is split with freshwater, saltwater, ponds, birds, reptiles, art. So there's a lot of stuff competing for attention. Some shows, like Macna, are geared towards business-to-business -business interaction and speaking engagements. Some are hardcore selling shows. Reefa Palooza is known for that. Some shows might draw in a huge crowd, but for whatever reason, that particular geography just doesn't spend as much as other cities. 
or they have a very specific taste where a particular coral to them is a local throwaway, while another kind of coral will sell like hotcakes. And if you bring the wrong coral to that venue, you're probably going to have a bad weekend. Anyhow, my tip is to ask around the other vendors and see what their favorite shows are. Some might be more forthcoming than others, granted, but you'd be surprised at how many people are willing to share their experiences. But keep in mind to also get an idea of what those vendors are even looking to do at these shows. Like, what were their expectations? Believe it or not, not every vendor there is necessarily looking to make money. Shocking, I know. Some companies are looking for exposure to get their name out. Some vendors are literally just there to offset their travel to the show because that is a very real expense. And the shows themselves are a ton of fun to go to. There is the show, and then there's the show after the show for the vendors. If you know, you know. And I'm not going to get into that. So you can either spend a grand or two out of pocket, or you can sell some corals and offset the cost of this mini vacation and have a great time. I know one place that doesn't care at all how much they sell at a show. And they're not looking to party. Not that I know of anyway. They're looking to buy from other vendors to enhance their coral collection back home. So my advice is to take in all of that data and decide for yourself which shows that you would like to exhibit at. Okay, guys, that does it from here. Hopefully this video was helpful to those of you that would like to one day be an exhibitor at a trade show. Until next time, happy reefing.